So welcome to unit two. We're going to be getting into more in-depth symbolization in this unit. This will, unit will have a relatively long set of videos because it's a pretty complicated topic. In this, I'm going to, in this first video, I'm going to introduce some terminology and some sort of broad issues. And in later videos, I'll be getting more in-depth into actually symbolizing. So the chapter one and two symbolic language are relatively easy to understand, and the reason for that is that the there's a fairly straightforward correspondence between the parts and the tree of a symbolic sentence and the parts and tree of an English sentence that the symbolic uh, sentence symbolizes. So if I say, if I eat a cookie, then I'll be happy, and P arrow Q, those both, they have the same basic tree. The if then corresponds to the arrow, if I eat a co cookie corresponds to P, and uh, I will be happy corresponds to Q. But that grammatical, that simple structural correspondence between chapter, the, uh, in chap that we have in chapter one and two, and the language chapter one and two in English on the other hand is lost when we get to chapter three. There is still a correspondence between the language that we're going to be English, the natural language we're going to be symbolizing, and the symbolizations we're going to produce between the English language and the logical language. But it's a more complicated correspondence, and it's not as straightforward. And so, in particular, if you remember, we have you know phrases like every wheel, excuse me, every whale, and some emu in the English that we symbolize. But there's no one unit, no one unit in the um, in the logical language that corresponds to the unit every whale. And so we don't have unit by unit sort of nice correspondence. There is a correspondence, but it's a more complicated one, as we'll see. And we'll see why that is as we go forward. But that's going to be the fundamental issue we're going to need to be working with. And we'll read to learn, in a way, we're going to learn to read the logic directly and not just by translation. So we'll take a logical sentence and say, what does it mean, without exactly translating it back into English first. So we'll see how we do that. So a little bit of terminology. We need to distinguish between symbols and occurrences of symbols. So if we look at the sentence, if fx then gx, we might say there, that there are four symbols that occur in the sentence, f, x, the arrow, and g. But there are five symbol occurrences making up this um, sentence. There's the f, there's the first x, there's the arrow, there's the G, and there's the second X. And so sometimes we're going to need to distinguish between a, a symbol or a kind of symbol on the one hand and occurrences of that symbol on the other hand. We also want to remember our notion of truth of. So we have formulas like FX, if EX and FX, and EX and CX. And for each of these, we can ask, is that formula true of a particular object when that when x refers to that object. So is fx true when uh, x refers to me? Is fx true when x refers to you? Is fx true when x refers to Big Bird? Okay, and so we can also ask questions like, are, is a formula true of at least one object? And is a formula true of every object? But we have this notion that, that formulas can be true or false of things. Now we also need this notion of overlay. So what's overlay? So if we look at this we have this sentence for all x, if fx, then some x, hx. It's a little bit hard to read, actually. Um, and the reason why, well, so remember, first of all, the notion of scope. So the scope of a logical operator is the part of the tree that it's above. So the scope of the universal is the entirety of the tree besides the top node. Whereas the scope of the existential is just the hx and the hx down the bottom, because that's the only part of the tree that it's above. Now, if we look at this other sentence, some y, g, y, and for all x, if fx and hx, we again have two quantifiers. And in one case, we have the sum y, which has scope over the g, y. And then we have the all x, which has scope over if fx and hx. In this, in the one on the left, or see, the one on the right, I guess, the one with the for all x, if fx, then sum x, hx, and then sum x, hx. The sum x is within the scope of the for all x, and we call that quantifier overlay. And that we don't have quantifier overlay in the other sentence, because if we look at sum y, there's no quantifier within its scope, and we look at the sum x, and there's no quantifier within its scope. So what we mean more generally 
is that in an overlay sentence, in a sentence with quantifier overlay in particular, one quantifier is within the scope of another. One quantifier is beneath another in the tree. And in a no overlay, in a no overlay sentence, we don't have that. We don't have one quantifier within the scope of another. So just to be clear about this, does this sentence have overlay or no overlay? No overlay, because the for all x has scope just over fx, and the sum y has scope over just sum over just the gy, and so no quantifier is within, this, within the scope of another. In this case, the sum y is within the scope of the for all x, and therefore this is a sentence with overlay. Now, the first sentence is pretty easy to read. It says, everything is a frog and something is green. The second sentence is kind of hard to read. It says, everything is such that, each thing is such that there's a thing such that the first is a frog and the second is green. And it might not be sure exactly what that means. In fact, it's exactly equivalent to the first sentence. They're true, one is true in a situation if and only if the other is true. So they end up saying the same thing, but one's a lot easier to read. Here we have for all x, Either each thing is either a frog or green. No overlay, there's only one quantifier, and so there's no way for one quantifier to be within the scope of another. Here we have quantifier overlay because the sum y is within the scope of the for all x. And finally, we have for all x if fy or gy, and again we would say that's no overlay because there's no quantifier within the scope of another. So as I was saying before, no overlay sentences are much simpler to understand than overlay sentences. And so now, so while our language allows no overlay sentences, they're perfectly grammatical, they have perfectly fine meanings, but they're hard to understand. And in symbolization, the best symbolization of a sentence will, at, at this point will never have any overlay in it. So what we're, while there are no overlay sentences, and they're perfectly grammatical sentences, we're going to ignore them for now because they would not be produced by a good symbolization of any of the sentences we're going to be working on. And that's something you'll want to bear in mind, that if you produce a, a symbolization that does have quantifier overlay, you've probably made a mistake. So here again we have more overlay. Actually, none of these have overlay. and But... but a further condition is that we only want no overlay sentences like the first two and not like the second two. In the in the very last one, the Y in FY is not within the scope of any quantifier at all. And in the very in the second to last one, the FY or GY are within the scope of a quantifier, but the variable variables don't match. Whereas in the first two Every variable is not only within the scope of a quantifier, but it's in, within the scope of a quantifier that it matches. So we want to have um, sentences, are no overlay sentences, should not only be no overlay sentences, but they should be sentences where every variable that does occur is within the scope of a quantifier, and it's within the scope of a quantifier phrase that it matches. So like the x in for all x fx matches the, the x in the fx matches the x in the for all x. Whereas in for all x, fy or gy, the y's do not match the um, for all x, the x in for all x. So you want to have, all your sentences should have no, all the variables should be within the scope of exactly one quantifier, and they should match that quantifier as far as variable goes. And when we have that, con and when a variable is within the scope of a quantifier and the variables match, then we say that the variable is bound. Okay. So that's what we need to know about quantifier overlay. We don't want sentences like that. We want sentences like the first two.